Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our latest Monitor File Monday tonight, all about rotation planning. It's great to have you all here as reflecting this series is instead of our Monitor File meetings around the country normally. And I was thinking at least tonight you can stay hopefully warm at home, no scraping of the car to do or driving back home on treacherous roads. So maybe there's an advantage. It's great to have so many of you here um, tonight to discuss a really important subject. Tonight's session came about um, after, well, as a steering group um, with Richard and his DIS Monitor Farm steering group, thinking about what we would do over the winter. And as part of that, rotations were a big um, question and consideration. Um, the question tonight is, can we be profitable and sustainable in our rotations um, with the policy changes coming up with break crops, um, with margins um, that's different? And we look forward to what Marion and Richard have got to say tonight um, to get us to that area. So without further ado, um, we'll move on to some housekeeping. We can sadly, um, we can't see you or hear you tonight, um, but you can very much stay in touch with us. In the panel on the side of your screen and the grey, um, there's a, a, a section at the bottom that says questions and you can put anything you'd like to say in there. Um, if you're having problems with any technology, Christian and I will come back to you um, and you can put uh, questions as you go through into that as well. We're scheduled to be here until eight o'clock tonight. Um, but we have got a lot of you um, logging on tonight. We've got over 300 of you now here with us. So if we need another few minutes of questions, we might be here till quarter past eight. And I hope that's all right with you all. But feel free um, to leave at any point if you need to, um, because the session is being recorded. You'll receive um, a recording of the webinar via your email um, tomorrow, and it'll also go up on our AHDB YouTube channel. If you'd like to stay in touch or share what you hear tonight, um, do have the conversation on Twitter, hashtag Monitor Farm links things together. If you'd like to claim your basis and there are also points, you can put these into the same questions box. If you'd like basis, if you pop your name, account number and postcode into the question box, and similarly for Neroso, the name, your Neroso member number, your date of birth and your postcode. And we've been awarded one basis and one Neroso for tonight. If you're watching this back, um, please feel free to email me, teresa.meadows at ahdb.org.uk with those details. So if we move on um, to the format for tonight, I'm really pleased um, to be here with Richard Ling, our Dis Monitor Farm host, and Marion Self, an independent agronomist with Prime Agriculture who covers the Suffolk area and is Richard's agronomist. We're here tonight to discuss this topic and we're going to do in true Monitor Farm style um, a bit of an introduction from Richard in a minute and then an exercise for you all. So while you listen in to that, I'd advise you all to go and grab a piece of paper and a pen because you're going to need to do um, something, some work to join us tonight. So once we've done that little exercise in a minute, we're then going to hand over to Marion to talk us through the considerations um, when planning a rotation from an agronomist point of view. And then Richard's going to give us the farmer view on that. We then aim um, to, to finish that section for quarter to 10 to 8. We've got time for some questions. And like I say, we'll see what the questions do, but we'll finish for 8, if not 8.15. Tonight is all about rotation planning and like I say I'm really pleased to be joined by Richard Ling who's our Monitor Farm host um, for Suffolk at the Dis Monitor Farm at Rookery Farm. Rookery Farm farms 400 hectares, a mixture of owned um, and contract farms. They're on a sandy clay loam, um, a clay loamy kind of soil and have got a rotation that Richard will talk to you about in a minute. They've got a series of cultivations that they do from plough to mint hill and thinking about crops that they could direct drill possibly in the future, a beef enterprise and diversification of business, let's say, run alongside. So I'm going to hand over to Richard, who's going to just give you a brief overview about this topic and its importance to him on the farm. Over to you, Richard. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. Um, so I thought we'd just, uh, just start with a little overview of just the, the farm as it was in 1980. Um, and, uh, and perhaps uh, if we just click forward, you'll then see uh, how the farm has sort of changed. And the reason I sort of wanted to just pick this out is because everything's focused around rotation. Um, and one of the big factors that comes into play is grain storage. Uh, now the sort of like the 
the top of the picture on both sides is is all grain storage. Uh, but there's a huge difference between what was there in 1980 and what's there now as a largely large sheds with flat floor stores uh, and pedestals, which is quick in and quick out. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. So um, where do we start? We'll just sort of give a bit more sort of farm history, really, understand the backstory, um, and uh, which I think is sort of like essential. Um, so if we go back sort of 20 years, um, rotation used to be sugar beet, one in three, uh, used to rotate grass and have forage maize for both the, uh, for the dairy herd. Um, and we used to have sort of farmyard manure, then sort of went back onto the fields. Um, but sugar beet and maize, both high soil erosion crops. So um, weed beet uh, then started to become an issue, uh, which gave us uh, reduced yields. Uh, so that meant that that crop was then unviable for us uh, and no longer an option. Uh, so then roll forward a few more years, um, dairy, we had big decisions to make. We had huge infrastructure investment was needed um, and, uh, and extremely tight margins. So we took the tough decision to sell the dairy herd. Um, and that meant that then the effect on the rotation was grass and maize then left the rotation. Um, so, and then 10 years on, we find ourselves needing no contractors uh, to harvest any of the crops um, with a, a a wheat wheat rate uh, or a wheat barley rate rotation. Having seen uh, having seen what happened with our predecessors with the sugar beet, um, we uh, we knew very quickly that our rotation was uh, was not sustainable uh, for the long term. So that brings us right up to today, um, where we're now in a sort of like a rate wheat rate. Um, uh, sorry, I'll say that again. A wheat rate wheat winter barley stroke spring barley uh, and we've now introduced uh, winter stroke spring beans um, and uh, and then back to back to wheat so that's it for me for now at the moment and I think tonight's all about just I know Richard you've got oil seed rate that's got a big question mark over it and trying to find that break crop that works for you and so tonight's all about having that discussion and you know thinking for your farm business that I'm sure is the same for many of those um, with us and watching here tonight so brilliant thank you Richard um, it gives us a good insight into um, the farm there at the Rookery Farm. So just in true Monitor Farm style, Marion and Richard, we'd normally be in a bit at all with pieces of paper and, and a pen. And um, so hopefully you've all got a piece of paper and a pen in front of you. For the more techie among you, um, there is on the on that same grey panel, there's a section labelled handouts. Um, and you can click on the one that says factors to consider when planning a rotation and you'll have this um, pop up in front of you as well. You could even print it out um, ready for us. So when thinking about this and thinking about rotation planning, we decided that actually there are a huge number of factors you think about when planning a rotation. And Marin, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, um, we started to list them. And actually, um, whether we can talk about all of these tonight or not, we'll, we'll see how many we get through. But there is a lot that you can do. Um, it's just how much impact um, they have on you and the business and how much control you have on them. So if you'd like to go to the next slide, Marion, what I'd like you all to do in front of you is to write an axis, put control on one side, impact on the bottom, your lows in the corner, your highs on the far end. And then if you click on again, Marion, if you could start and put these kind of factors as to what level you think um, they have an impact on your business and what level of control you have over them. So pick something like markets and where you might sell your crops to, um, Brexit, dare we say, a loss of actives, what soil type you have, where do you think they would fit for you on the graph? And we just thought this might be quite a good place to start when we're thinking about the conversation in terms of rotation planning. Perhaps if you want to pop into the chat where some of your key ones are and, and where you see it. But I guess tonight is kind of thinking about all of these things in the round um, that you as farmers and business owners, advisors, consultants think about. 
Um, in true Blue Peter style, Rich has kindly um, done one of these for you. So while you're while you're filling that in in front of you, um, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, Marion, then maybe Richard, we can hear what your thinking is for some of these. So if we pick out maybe machinery for you, Richard, or your fixed costs, what why is that high impact and high control um, for you? Yeah. So um, if we take fixed costs and machinery for instance so you'll notice here i've grouped quite a lot of them together um and and because i i think some of the quite a few of these are actually in very similar uh levels um fixed costs and machinery are very much in our within our control uh, but they also have quite a high impact so um whereas if you look at soil type right down the bottom um unless you change your farm you can't exactly change your soil type um, you know, other than the way in which we farm it, you know, if you abuse it all the time, then it will get more difficult to farm. If you look after it, it will become easier to farm. But, you know, it, that's by contrast, the cash flow and fixed costs and the machinery, they're all well within our, our control as a farm manager or farm owner. And, and when you think about rotation planning, is it naturally those bits that you think about first, Richard? It's quite interesting, kind of the way you group them and, and maybe how you think about them. Yeah, because because fixed costs are, and and the cost of machinery has now gone so high, um, then you really do have to, you know, you have to make sure that these sorts of things are actually brought in under control before you can then start to look at the next stage which is right okay so i've chosen my crop then i need to start choosing varieties and and what varieties are better from a disease and pest point of view and um you know and that's when we start having conversations with marion and uh, start exploring her skills <laughs> many of those brilliant um, if you if you've done that at home we'd be pleased to see where you've got things and um, feel free to tweet us and um, with your answer live we can maybe share some of those um, as we go through later and um, send me a whatsapp picture um with your your sheet of what you've done at home hopefully you've taken part and um, the guys here know that homework is is not com questionary here is it when we're sat in world and village hall everybody has to do this so um send us what you think hopefully it's made you kind of think about some of the things and all the different things that you guys have got to consider so um without further ado i think we're going to hand over to marion and she's going to pick up on some of the things in here and talk us through what to think about possibly when planning your rotation and um, from an agronomist point of view and rich and i'll be back to discuss that in a bit so over to you marion Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, great to be able to talk to you all this evening. So I'm just going to crack on, really, quite a large subject and not so much time, really. So we'll try and do it justice. So um, we've just been thinking about rotation and the factors that are impacting on our decisions and our planning. And I've made my own list here. Um, I, I just think that it's quite a familiar list these days that we, we hear a lot about and some of these things will already have impacted on your decisions regarding rotation and if not some of these will be banging quite loudly at your door and maybe they're about to force change or at least make you think about making some changes. So it's not an exhaustive list by any means, I mean we did mention other things in the previous exercise. And I'm sure that you can think of some more factors that nationally are having going to have an impact or have had an impact on you, but also locally to you, there'll be local factors and, and factors that are actually quite personal to your own business as well. So I just thought maybe it was um, just take a moment very quickly now to just, just think back and um, consider how your rotation has changed over the last five years. Um, I'm sure there have already been some, some tweaks that you've made. And to think, you know, further ahead or not so far ahead, perhaps, or what changes you're considering and, and what do you expect, what changes do you expect to have to make? So in terms of, um, in terms of rotation, we're just going to sort of think about um, the risks and the challenges and, and how we're going to adapt to that. And I would say that one of the biggest risks that we come across in the 
in the rotation is choosing the best break crop option for you. I find that growers, and talking to my colleagues as well, that growers that sort of have got the best break crop options for them seem to seem to have the best, the more successful businesses. Obviously, they're getting as much profit as they can out of those break crops, but also it's obviously having an impact on the cereal rotation going forward from that. So, I mean, it, it's just mastering those break crops is really important. And we all know about risk when we think about something like oilseed rape. Many of you who have grown it in the past, maybe growing less area, may, some of you may have even given up on it. But what we have done is thought about this risk. And we've we've taken on board sort of trying to manage some of these issues like cabbage stem flea beetle, for instance. I mean, recently, over recent years, we've really focused in and tried to um, you know, we've thought about or have changed insecticide regimes in the autumn. We've changed, uh, you know, thinking on or upped our ante in terms of nutrition in the autumn, thinking about using companion crops and perhaps, you know, adapting the time of sowing as much as we can as well, all to sort of mitigate against risks. And um, another part of that is generally we've reduced the level of our early inputs, but we do still understand that we need to put a certain amount of uh, nurturing and inputs into this crop to get it through the autumn and winter, um, and you know, a little bit of pest control and, or, or whatever you're doing, but we have, you know, made changes to adapt to this risk. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't work out and we need to move on from rape and that's the holy grail, isn't it? Trying to find out you know what to grow instead and you as growers and your agronomists are, are really risk managers if you like if you think of yourself in that way and we've just talked about the rate crop and how how you would operate as a risk manager in in, in that instance but also moving away from the rape idea but um in terms of this risk management um we're getting that advances in science now so we can have scenarios perhaps where we can make more real-time decisions maybe we can do some you know leaf testing to get some rapid disease results so we can adapt our programs more in real time as we go through the season so in those sort of things coming on board so in terms of the rotation then what can you do to adapt well I'd say if you're struggling with something or something needs to change, then then try something new. I suppose that's obvious, really. But what what can you do? Well, a couple of ideas here, you know, try a different crop. Now, this is all very well um, said and done, but some of these more novel crops, in my opinion, aren't quite ready for the broad acres yet. So if you want to try something new, dip your toe in the water and then move out from there. Um, I think just go steady and and ask others that have tried it before talk to other people get ideas and uh you know grill your agronomist we we see things we we move around the place we work with different people we have colleagues that are covering large areas so you know it might be that we've got we might have something useful to say you never know but go steady and um you know for example things like winter linseed you know people often want to try that as a different idea to rape um, but you know it can work out but sometimes you know if you've got black grass issues sometimes these things are tried and they don't work out but you know you've got to do your own thing you've got to try and run your own path I guess but but go in with you know some some ideas behind you just lost my mouse there yeah okay and in terms of machinery, you know, if you need to think about trying some new machinery, you know, get a demo in or, or, or have a look what your neighbour's doing. Um, you know, maybe if you don't want to, you know, you're trying something new, then, you know, talk to someone else, get a contractor to come in and do a little bit of work for you while you settle into the idea. Maybe there's something you can do, you know, a job for them just just try and work together really before making big investments um I'm, I'm sure you all know what i mean but what i would say is quite important when you're making these changes is you'll obviously sit down and think about it and predict what you think the outcome is but it's also very important to to measure so 
make a fair analysis of the results of your change. You know, was it what you expected or was there another factor that unexpectedly um, influenced the result? Just keep measuring and analysing and, you know, that's the way to adapt and change and move on. OK, so we can't really talk about rotations without talking about crop margins. And there's always a debate whether to use net or gross margin in discussion. As an agronomist, I quite often use the gross margin because it is a useful comparison between crops, but it doesn't always show how profitable a crop is. I think on farm, one of the most more useful comparisons is a net margin because obviously that includes the total cost of production. So it's taking account of all your fixed and variable costs. So on a business level, if you can get those figures, um, net margins can be most useful when, when you know what they are for your very own business. And just talking about net margins, I think they're important on a business per business level because it's important to understand that, you know, net margins for the same crop can vary as much between businesses as a net margin between crops on the same farm. You know, net costs can vary so much between a business. So just, just to bear that in mind as well. But moving on from that, I'm just going to go through some gross margins just to quickly compare some crops, but we haven't got a lot of time to dwell on this. So there's lots of sources of gross margins out there. This just happens to be our, our prime agriculture gross margin booklet. Um, but some, I've just picked out some yields and some prices here to give gross margins per crop. I mean, you will look at the prices. You might think they're a little bit out of date because things have, have moved up a little bit recently. But this is just to, to give us something to discuss. So those of us that are into arable farming really going to hinge our rotation quite around wheat still quite a bit and you can see there as we probably expect that the first wheat is giving a feed is giving one of the higher margins um, that's probably not a surprise and if you were growing um, a milling variety as a first then obviously you'd have a milling premium on there and that would push that up even more although in my area quite a lot of the time milling crops are, are grown in the second wheat position but I just wanted to also highlight why we're here look at the winter barley there yeah okay on paper doesn't look like the best option um, in terms of monetary but um you know it has other benefits we you know we know that it it gives us earlier harvest it spreads workloads it work sorry it spreads workloads it gives good opportunities for early entry of oil seed rape so you know although you know it can still have a really important place um, in the rotation although I do have some growers that do tell me it's a weed, so I do have to be careful where I say this. Um, spring cereals here. Just to say, you know, margins fair enough, these gross margin figures, but like here on, on paper, spring wheat looks like the best option, but I quite often have find that growers, you know, and will decide that it's probably best actually to grow a spring barley because we might get a more consistent result. And we know also where we've got black grass issues that black grass competition goes up exponentially as you move from wheat to barley to oats. So we have to think about that as well. Um, you know, and, and the competition from these other crops um, quite often overrides the fact that we've got a wider approval of herbicides for, for grass weed control in wheat. And, you know, just taking the benefits of the competition of those other crops. And here we've got some gross margins for break crops. I mean, don't get too hung up on the figures. I just want to highlight here that something like rape is still giving us one of the best margins in terms of break crops, if you can grow it reasonably well. But what I do want to say as a caveat to that is this is based on this yield and price that I put up here. But if you're really, be realistic with yourself, if you're really more likely to achieve 2.25 tonnes a hectare, then you know um, your your gross margin is going to be near 170 pounds per hectare, and then if you minus your fixed costs, then it really doesn't look so pretty. So you really need to be um, quite realistic with yourself about what's going on on your own farm. And we talked about risk earlier with rape, and I'm sure you're all 
<laughs> you've probably heard enough about this cropper for your own sanity anyway but you know we can get some quite good rape crops that go into the winter and then at this time of year and beyond they start to go backwards and you need to be monitoring those crops just to make sure they're not loaded with flea beetle larvae because if you're not careful you've spent you know come the first nitrogen dose being on and a few variable quite a few variable costs over winter, you've suddenly spent quite a lot of money on a crop that's not going to do as well as you think. Um, you could get to first end dose and put something like, you know, £290 worth of, of, of variable costs on there. So just got to be very um, aware of what's going on, really. Yeah. All good. Um, Lightlands, you've got some other options there. I won't dwell on them. So we, we talked about crop margins, we know that there are some public figures out there, but you know, I think it's really, really important that you guys, you know, and I know that a lot of you do it already, but know your own variable and fixed costs for each of the crops that you grow. It's really important that we take time to calculate these and look at them and evaluate them. So scrutinise your costs, discuss them with your agronomist, make them work. <laughs> yeah. If any of my guys are listening, not too hard. And, um, you know, learn from others. Um, I think it's really important to sort of discuss ideas with your peers. And there's there's opportunities out there. I know Richard, had, well, I won't, can't really speak for him, but I'm pretty sure talking to him that he's really enjoyed, um, you know, working with benchmark groups. You've got the AHDB benchmark groups. You've got yield clubs and, you know, really good platforms to fresh ideas out and just make yourselves think you know great great get your old brain cells ticking over and how you can make things better so look for opportunities and i guess i guess it's really important to say at the moment you know do your budgets and in your figures you know look at it without those basic payments in there because we all know that um that's the way we're moving yeah okay so the next two slides are going to break up with Richard, so going to bring him in um, to uh, to comment on what he's doing and, and how things are going for him. So I'll just whiz through this start slide, Richard, and then we'll, we'll bring you in. Yeah. So um, we talked about margins. Really important when sort of putting a plan together, but it's not everything. Um, and there are other factors that build into making our decisions around rotation. So be realistic about those margins. I think I've banged that home enough. If you're growing rape and it's still not working for you, then maybe time to try something else. Um, so does the crop work in the rotation? Is it in the best position? Is it a true cereal break if that's what you're looking for? Um, think about your local markets and contracts. Are there any premiums that you can chase? I mean, maybe seed, milling, brewing, micronizing of peas. There are things out there, but a caveat to that, I guess, is the obvious really, but make sure you can meet those premiums if, if your margin really depends on them. So, you know, is it achievable in terms of your soil type, weather, um, you know, combine capacity, harvest delays, all affect, you know, spec sometimes. So just be realistic about that. And also it might be just worth saying some of these pulses and linseed um it, the, the um pre-basic price for seed is, is it, the price of pre-basic seed is actually quite expensive so we need to factor that in so um i think rich is going to mention some things that he's tried in the past but um you know is the climate suitable is the soil type suitable um things like soya lupins sunflowers ahi flower whatever it is that you want to try good for you but um you know just be realistic about um how adaptable these are to broader acres do you have the appropriate machinery we've talked about talking to your mates and and seeing if you can get someone to help you if that's appropriate and also seasonal workloads we talked about barley and the you know how you can spread your speed spread your peak usage of your key machinery like your drills your sprayers and your combines all kind of obvious stuff so i'm going to bring richard in now hello richard hello um yeah so i just wanted to talk further on um we've got a picture here of, uh, of some lupins and some millet um and really 
you know, I think back to where we used to have the dairy cows and, and dad really wanted to um, get some more protein in the diet without having to buy it in at extortionate high levels. Uh, so he, he decided many moons ago to uh, to have a go at some lupins. Uh, anyway, the, 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 we did make it to harvest. Um, it was a quite a lot of trial and error um, with the inoculant on the seed and, and everything that goes with that. It wasn't just straight out of a bag, straight in the drill and, and stick it in the ground. Um, but the field, when it started emerging, it actually came up quite patchy. Uh, and we soon realised that um, that they hadn't quite filled us in on uh, on everything about pH and how sensitive the crop was to pH. Uh, so we had an extremely good yield map that represented the pH exactly uh, for that field. Um, so and then when it comes to actually then marketing that crop, uh, the company that we actually um, uh, had got the contract with then turned around and said. Uh, Oh no, the uh, the the home for those hasn't actually come off uh, because it was such a niche crop. Um, so we ended up having to try and roll them and feed them through some cattle, but because there was a small quantity, um, so it it didn't exactly come off. So then rolled forward a few years, and uh, and I decided a few years ago we'd try some millet, uh, and we actually um, on some light land that that isn't very good at cereals. So I thought, well, you know, we've got nothing to lose. We used to grow sugar beet and maize down there uh, as part of that rotation for that really light land. Um, now everything was fine until uh, until it came to harvest, uh, and it was from what I can gather, it was quite a good crop of millet. Um, but you know, when you start having to harvest a crop in September and you start getting a few high winds and the odd wet day here and there, um, it's funny how all the uh, I'm not talking about early September, I'm talking about mid September onwards. Uh, and you soon start sort of losing your uh, losing your your weather windows. So then we roll forward into the picture that's just come up, uh, and this is triticale. So this was spring triticale, um, and it was a specialist seed contract. Now this was actually quite a good contract, um, and it and it all went quite well. But you know, again, this was a more sensible harvest timing. Um, but it's still got its limitations. At the end of the day, triticale, it's still, you know, markets are still limited. So what do you do if, if it doesn't make that contract spec? Um, you know, this was going for a seed crop. So we had to make sure it was clean um, and, and everything like that. So um, you, you have to bear all these things in mind when you're trying these different crops. So um, next slide, please. So, and then leading on from that, um, you know, we we used to have a lot of, um, we have to re used to have to rely on contractors for sugar beet harvesters. And, and when we were doing the maize on the cows, we had, had to get contracts in with the forage harvesters and trailers and different things. Uh, and, you know, these, these are all extremely high cost items, um, which all have quite a large relevance to those crops. Um, and quite large, large parts of the cost of growing those crops. So just forward the next, probably do the next two, I think. Yeah, so machinery wise, you've then got, you know, if, if you have to put farmyard manure onto a field, um, you know, sometimes you have to plow things in, again, increasing, increasing fixed costs. So and the reason why have I put an old class combine in there? Well, you know, going back a few years, when we tried those lupins, one of the biggest issues we had was that we really wanted to grow rape uh, as well on the farm, but we used to have a combine just like that. Uh, and it and it used to leak like a sieve. You know, it's quite good at barley and barley and wheat, but any small seeds would have just come out left, right and centre. So, um, so we, you know, we, we didn't grow rape many years ago when a lot of other people were trying it because at that time our machinery wasn't really good enough. Um, so and the other thing to then start factoring on if we go just one more forward um, is if you if you look at things like linseed you know do we need something like a stripper header to start you know harvesting the linseed um, you know and, and, and it's all 
adding extra cost you know it's fine if you've got other crops that that stripper header can go through or if you can use a normal header for a for linseed but then you start getting wrapping and with red loam disappearing you know there's a whole host of different questions which i'm you know i don't grow linseed so i'm not experienced in it at all and maybe marion can touch on that or or you know pick her brains another day if you want um so if we just go forward another one more um the um and the other biggest issue is i you know if i want to try linseed it's fine i could go down down to my friends down the road mr barker and and have a look at his stripper header but it's not going to go onto my combine so then i'm going to have to add more cost into my linseed if i try linseed um because i'm going to have to get him to come with his combine as well as his header um so or i'm going to have to try and cut it direct um which is um, potentially quite risky so um these are all different options this is what i'm trying to highlight this is all different options that we need to ask ourselves before going into these crops um you know are, are we ready are we do we have the right machinery to have a go at that crop so if we go forward okay shall i take over for yeah. a bit just for this slide yeah. so um now again thinking that it's not just about margin Mo moving on to some other factors that are really quite topical at the moment and becoming you know rightly so quite important into our thinking so we want to think about our rotational choices in terms of their impact on you know soil structure and fertility and we've always you know we've always thought about pulses in terms of end fixing and providing a good following wheat crop yeah okay um things like linseed though um you know make a really friable topsoil really fibrous roots in the top there that really quite useful moving forward and and they're also quite good at um making up um or promoting these mycorrhizal fungi and then we've got brassicas which perhaps aren't so good at that well not good at that mycorrhizal business but they do have deep penetrating roots that have their own place in the rotation and their own usefulness and and actually they actually can quite often produce biofumicants. So, you know, different different horses for different courses, yeah. Um, but that, that whole subject area is becoming more and more important to us. Um, and then this next one, weeds, pests and diseases. I mean, this is the age old reason as to why we actually have a rotation, isn't it? So, you know, bringing that diversity of cropping in so that we can tackle you know, prevent a buildup of, of these issues. Um, you know, also by changing the crop type, as you all know, gives us the opportunity to bring in different actives um, to present resistance buildup and, and also, you know, just prevent the buildup of the problem full stop. So things, you know, you'll be familiar with grass weeds, and cabbage stem flea, to, flea beetle, aphids, all these things that are, you know, can be helped by choosing the right rotation, let's put it that way. And those of you that are battling black grass, um, let's face it, it's most of us over my way at least, um, think about your rotation in terms of what you can do to help with your grass weed control. So, um, you know, obviously things like we can move what we do grow, you know, growing some winter wheat later in black grass situations and to, mm, if I'm really honest, you know, we need to be sort of into November to really get a good impact on that. Or if it's really serious, we need to be introducing more spring cropping, which I'm sure you're already on that on that train, as, as it were. Um, but, you know, think about that in terms of rotation. Also, another coming more and more important for us now is, is there time for a catch crop or is there an opportunity to grow some cover crops? Um, you know, cover crops great for soil stability. We also know that they do reduce nutrient leaching between crops, um, you know, stabilizing the soil, as I've said, restructuring the soil, you know, this whole adding organic material back into the soil, a huge subject area, um, but, you know, not to be ignored and becoming more and more important as we move forward. Um, but there's still lots to learn about cover crops and how to really use those going forward. And um, biodiversity, pretty obvious one really, but the more 
different crop types you grow, the more diversity you're going to bring into your system above and below the ground. Yeah, again, becoming important. Well, always been important, but really right there in the top of our front of our minds. And just my last point here, um, just uh, a bit more mundane, perhaps. Um, doesn't really fit with the ones above, but I just wanted to say that just make sure you've got enough storage for, um, well, of course you would make sure, but it, it takes, you do need to think about what you can actually do, especially on some of these contract farms. Have you got the ability to have storage of segregation of different crop types and even segregation of crops that are going for different markets? So that can be a challenge and that can sometimes limit what we can do. Just just something to mention, I think. Um, Richard will have a word about it, but I haven't mentioned sort of, you know, we came, you know, more thoughts on grass lays and, and the elms that options like a, a double legume um, that I think Rich is going to touch on in a minute. So I'll leave that one to him. Uh, just before we do that, one more thing. Um, so leaving land fallow, um, I'm sometimes asked if that's the best thing to do. And Sometimes it is necessary, but my reaction really is to avoid it if you can, because the less just if you've got more fallow, you've got less cash coming into the business, puts more of your fixed costs over a smaller area. And you can't always reduce, always reduce your other costs to fully comp compensate for that reduction in, in income unless you make some fundamental change to the business, which might be a big one like machinery or cultivation type or um you know labor um so yeah got to think about that as i'm sure you would and we've got elms coming um you have still got lots to learn and how they're going to fit into our businesses but try and choose a scheme that will help reduce your fixed costs and not increase them you might need a little bit of thought just to be careful um, and and do choose if you can choose a scheme that gives an additional financial benefit. It might not be an immediate benefit, but will have a knock-on um, positive impact. Um, yeah, just we've got work to do on this, but yeah. And then put together a planned rotation with your own figures. But um, I think hopefully we're getting across now that you know changing the highest average gross margin um, is not sustainable. Um, in the past, you know, we have had short term gains from rotations like wheat, wheat rate that have been quite tight. But where that has been going on, we're now paying for that really in terms of things like grass weeds and cabbage stem flea beetle and, you know, other things. But it's, um, you know, the poor investment and less diversity causes problems in the long run. And these these problems that I've just alluded to can be expensive to fix. And eventually they lead to a more varied rotation being the most appropriate thing anyway. So, you know, I think we're we're all learning and probably learned a few of these lessons already. Um, I would urge you to think about a nice long rotation if you can. Um, okay, it's personal to you what you can and can't do, but um, just think about a rotation that gives you opportunities to get some more organic matter in there, some muck or liming or use of cover crops, whatever it is that is um, is going to do it for you. Um, you know, things that, you know, rotation that gives you time to do drainage, ditching, moling, all those things that are important in, in making things a good success. So really, I would say that choose a rotation that, oh, this is easier said than done, hey, that reduces your risk and improves your soil. And then you're on that holy grail towards that fantastic word sustainability. So um, yeah, that, that's my little thought. And now over to Richard with some figures. Everybody likes figures, Richard. <laughs> right, so um, here we go. Where do we start? Um, well, at Rookery Farm, I've... Um, sort of help put together this gross margin guide, which I basically um, use uh, quite usefully. So if we can just click to the first couple of circles. Yeah. Um, so just draw your attention. So I'm not going to talk about gross margins. I'm going to go straight in at the deep end and go with net margins. Uh, so you'll see uh, fixed costs in there. So winter cereals, I put a, a nominal figure in of 450. 
uh, and springs of 400. Um, now, I know across the board, ours, thanks to the farm bench, are about 398 um, on our uh, on our fixed costs. So, um, so just to give you a, a, a fair indication. Um, so, the, on the left hand side, you've got the the circle that's got three uh, three wheat columns. Now, I've helped so I put a green and red in there just to highlight all as that is they're all the same price but that's just yield um and that's that's the difference um you know you go from a respectable ten and a half ton a hectare first wheat crop at eight two two five fifty um down to a seven ton a hectare crop um and it's 173 pound yes it's still the right side but it just goes to show how when you start adding these fixed costs in how skinny these margins really are um, and how we have to be quite careful. Um, so I'm going to move it along uh, to the next uh, next bit on the right hand side, right in the middle, you've got um, winter rape and winter beans. So these at the moment are our sort of break crops, sort of proper break crops, if you like, on the farm. Now, the caveat to that is that that's all well and good with, with rape if you can get your yield. Um, which I mean, we've been fortunate the last couple of years um, that I mean we got away with it with the skin of our teeth last year with a three ton a hectare crop, um, but hopefully this year we'll, we'll you know we've got a better crop out there, more consistent crop. So um, hopefully we'll be able to increase on that for this year. Um, and then winter beans. Now this one sort of quite quite surprised me really uh, and it was after last year's winter beans that we suddenly realized that um, yield uh, isn't always there and we found ourselves last year's where you know we're a ton of hectare off that four figure so you know we thought we were doing great um, trying to get a nice uh, nice entry for first wheat this year um, which will bring sort of an additional benefit to that first wheat of about half a ton a hectare. Um, but, you know, we, we didn't really make a lot. Um, we, well, we definitely wouldn't have made a lot of money last year on the beans. Um, so anyway, we sort of moved forward onto spring crops. Uh, now, spring barley has always been my traditional go to spring crop. Um, sort of know it fairly well now. Um, but I just want to highlight the, the spring break crop options here. Um, you've got three circled and, and, you know, if we can't get winter beans in, then we at the moment we're sort of switching those into spring beans. Well, you start looking at those those figures there for spring beans. Well, there's still not that much margin really in, in spring beans. Uh, and this when I was pulling this together the other day, you know, it surprised me how how good really that peas looked. And, and I hadn't even really considered peas because of the horrific stories of, you know, what happens if they go down? Have we got the right machinery if they do go down? Uh, and, and no experience in growing peas, um, you know, so I went with the safer option, which was beans. But I'm, I'm probably going to have to refine, refine my thoughts um, on that one. So and then just to also put the last bit into context. So at the bottom below net net margin hectare on the bottom left, uh, I've got a black grass risk value, um, good or bad, uh, and then a compaction factor and a yield benefit to next crop. Factor. Uh, now, these are all percentages that I've then adapted my gross margin to try and help me tease out. So if we take sugar beet, for instance, you know, I know there's going to be a, a large if, if we late lift those sugar beet, um, there's going to be a lot of compaction in that field, which is going to have a detrimental effect on the next crop. Whereas if I grow a bean crop, I know it's going to give me a good benefit to the next crop. So I've tried to factor this in in my gross margin guide. So if we just go to the next slide. So this brings me on to this slide. So that, that previous rotation uh, of gross margin and net margin um, Excel spreadsheet, uh, sort of setting us up for this one. So I've put in two, two different sequences on here. Uh, we've got the four year one, which is, a, which is pretty much where we were 12 months previous. Uh, so we now have actually ended, added beans, but um, let's just take it as it is for now. Um, 
So if we just put some of the rings up there, please. So we're going to look at the net margin figure column again. Um, and so what is the net net margin across all four, you know, on a per year basis for a four year rotation sequence? Um, well, that comes in at, at 55850. Uh, and that's averaged across those that four year so sequence. So if we then look down that same column uh, and we look at the seven year rotation and that's spread out average per year, that's in there at five five hundred and eighteen. So you know we've got a difference there of about forty pound a, a hectare uh, between the two. Um, but what I think we've also gained in that is that you've gained a lot more sustainability within a seven-year rotation as to what's currently in that four-year rotation. Um, so just one other thing which I'd quite like to mention here is that, you know, we've got spring beans in there currently in that seven-year rotation. Um, so if we take out the spring beans and we add in spring peas, um, you know, straight away that makes a difference of £285 a hectare, um, you know, which then brings that average per year figure on the seven year up to 559. Well, that's just slightly better than our 55850 on the four year rotation. So not only are we pretty much at the same financial level um, by having a seven year rotation, we are also hopefully got a more sustainable rotation. So, and now I've, I've just listed a few more questions at the top, which I think we're going to do a poll on in a, in a moment um, for us to go through. But if we just forward on to the, the next bit, because there was one more piece that I wanted to put in, uh, and it was about AB15, uh, you know, going forward with Elms, we're going to have more, uh, more of these things that come along. Um, but there's a big issue looming here. Um, you know, we've got at the bottom there, the margin, by the time you've taken your fixed costs off, is only £48.95, which is is not enough. I know there's the unknown quantity of, of um, you know, fertility building that you get from having an AB15, but you've also got seed costs and things like that that are attributed. They are in there, um, you know, and I, I've tried to be as accurate as I can with those figures. So really, the, the big big bit is the fixed costs um, so if you just and, and that for me is you know the big watchword here is if we don't address our fixed costs with anything that's connected to the elm side of things um, and we don't start you know whether it be talking to our neighbors and and or just spreading you know reducing something farm change you know a bit like marion alluded to that you know, we've got to be extremely careful. If we suddenly start putting a lot of these things in, um, we could find ourselves um, worse off than just growing cash crops. Thank you both so much. Um, a lot to, to take in and think about there. And we've got lots of um, questions for you that have popped in. So I know you've just got one slide left to kind of summarise us up, Marion. Um, but we just thought we'd ask you all a question at this stage. Um, having got to there with Richard, um, what rotation would you recommend that Richard carries forward at Rookery Farm? Do you think he should kind of carry on with the four year one or the seven year one, possibly given the choices um, that you've just seen? So if you haven't voted before on a poll, if you click on the screen in front of you, you should be able to select one of those. And it'd be interesting to hear what you think. Um, very monitor farm style. It's what we like to hear um, very much. What, what you think should carry on. So we've got 62% of you still paying attention. Oh, we're going up now. So if you want to show the results, Christian, that'd be great. Uh, so, quite conclusively, seven year, 80, 80%, 22% still think possibly keep it simple, Richard, um, and keep the four years. So, based on that, then, we're just interested to hear why you chose that. Um, so, if you can launch the next poll, um, Christian, why? And we've narrowed you down to select one of these. So, as Richard said, is it because of the margin? Is it because you have a kind of a keenness to improve soils or 
control of your pest, weeds and diseases, thinking about managing your fixed costs or diversity and the rotation. I know you're probably screaming at me wanting to click um, one or two, but I'm going to push you into selecting um, one of those. So we've got over half of you have voted now. And we have a question from John that came through as well about what is AB15? Um, great question from you, John. It's the two year sown legume fallow. So one of the options that's available at the moment in countryside stewardship. And Richard added it in as a, as a nod towards the future in terms of environmental schemes. So Richard and um, Christian, if you want to show the answers. So diversity in the rotation and um, the driving force for 37% of you, shortly followed by a thought on soils. Um, Marion, you'll be pleased to see their control of pest, weeds and diseases. But those of you considering the margin and the fixed costs important as well. So I think if we'd given you multiple options there, um, there'd be multiple answers that you'd have given us. So I don't know. Any thoughts on that, Richard? Uh no, I think it's it's quite interesting, really. You know, uh, it's quite restrictive, I suppose, on the poll. But um, yeah, 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 it's all it's all good food for thought, and uh, and I think I concur with everybody else on the seven year option. Good, thank you, thank you, Christian. Uh, so, if you want to go to your summary slide, Marion, and then we'll ask these um, questions to everyone. Okay, so. So really quickly, really, just to just to say um, in summing up, I think what we've really talked about is, is know your own figures, your fixed, your variable costs and um, be realistic about what you can achieve in terms of yield and market. And don't be afraid to try new things out, maybe gently. I know sometimes you've got to grow enough to make a lorry load or whatever, you know, is practical. But, you know, try things, start small, find out what works and um, monitor the results yeah have a budget and monitor the results and then you know most important thing of all is you know recognizing when something needs to change uh, and and that's really um what i would say and i i just leave you with this little quote from darwin and just as a i think richard you're going to survive you're going to evolve you're going to survive <laughs> Fantastic, Marion. Um, very poignant points you've got up there on the slide. Um, and yeah, thank you for all your thoughts. It's it's a difficult one to do this webinar because there's no silver bullets out there, and I've got lots of people asking me all the questions that you two are going to answer now to solve all of our our rotation problems um, that's out there. But there's no easy answer, and I think what you've got in front of you, Marion, is is the best place to start. If, if we do know our figures, at least we're going to it um, in a good place and we can do. So um, I've got lots of questions that have come in. I am just going to take another few minutes to ask these questions. So if you do need to leave us now, um, thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. If you're prepared to hold on, we're going to do another um, couple of minutes of questions and we'll make sure we're finished for quarter past eight. Um, so if you've got a question, if you pop it in the questions box and um, you put your basis and Neroso points in, if you haven't put your basis and Neroso points in now's your chance um, and pop that in we need your membership number your postcode and your date of birth um, if you would like neuroso points and um, so um lots of different kind of questions here richard and marion but some along a, a good theme um what would be your opinion marion um to start with on the optimum gap between growing a certain break crop um for example kind of seed rape or pulses and thinking about thinking cover crops and companion cropping in, does that mean the rotation needs to change to accommodate those new parameters? Quite a poignant question for the moment. Okay, so um, let's break it down. So um, usually the longer, the better, but we have to be practical, don't we? So with pulses, um, we usually say one in five. I mean, there are times when you've got to get rotation sensible between blocks of land and you have to go shorter than that but we should be looking at one on one in five at least really um, and if we've got problems with foot rot and things like that much longer or, or not growing them um, rape uh, you know the longer the better really but you know really one in four um, you know there's been work from Morley or Nyab tag over the years that have shown you know how how lengthening that rotation you can sort of bring back some of the yield that we've lost over the years um you know compared to a virgin crop so that data is out there 
Um, in terms of companion cropping and cover crops, you do need to think about what else is in the rotation. Um, sometimes it's not as important as you would think because the cover crop or the companion crop's not in the ground long enough to sort of build up the pests and disease issues that could become a problem. But um, yeah, I mean, for instance, do you grow a brassica cover crop when you've got a lot, you know, relying on rape and the rotation? Well, some would say it doesn't matter too much, but, you know, there is a little background worry about things like club root and things. But, you know, I think for the length of time, it's, in, it's not too big of a issue, but, you know, try and avoid it. Try something else. Yeah. And kind of building on that, do you think, um, you know, do we have a minimum rotation length we should be aiming for? Or do you think it's kind of how how flexible do we need to be with weather and things as well? It's, it's a good question at the moment. I know it's something we discussed putting this webinar together. Um, I'll have a little go, then I'll maybe ask Richard for his thoughts. I think Richard demonstrated quite well there, actually, that, yeah, I mean, it, if you you can look at your figures and, and, you know, you have to be quite wily, but with your figures, you are armed to have a look at and make um, scenarios up of different rotations. And Richard had managed to demonstrate there that a longer rotation had actually you know, bought in as, as good a money at the end of the day as, as a shorter one. But obviously there are practicalities around these things. And, um, you know, it, 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 you have to do what's right for your business and, and your, your, you know, what you're working with, really. Um, but as I said, the longer the rotation, the more um, opportunities for all those sort of maintenance, you know, factors, um, you know muck and cover crops and things like that then then the better yeah and if you can your figures show it to be an advantage then that's even better isn't it richard do you have anything to add to that um no I, other than just i look i played about quite a bit with the uh with the rotations uh planning part uh after doing my gross margin guide um and the reason i sort of ended up on the seven year was if I shortened it, then I didn't get as many first wheats in it as first wheats, the high yielding first wheat options that really bring that into its own. And and it's also trying to keep clear distances between things like peas uh, and making sure that, you know, and it's also the same with all seed rape, you're sort of protecting it so that you are you have your best chance at getting that break crop to be a really good break crop um, as opposed to just an average one, which, you know, we saw that on, you know, as soon as you start reducing the tons, tons per hectare that you start getting and, and some of these things start coming in because you're, you're trying to push rotations or you're trying to squeeze in these extra crops or something um, and you sort of shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, very valid. Um, and we've got lots of questions for you here on, um, as a suggestion, I'm just scrolling through Richard about um, maybe shortening, why don't you go for a six year rotation, cut out the linseed and have a margin of £590. So somebody's got their calculator out for you. Um, there's a few questions about, should we have somebody here, Roger, wishing you good luck growing quality peas without dye crop? Um, somebody else saying, will you be trying spring peas? Jonathan wants to know, Richard. Um, I'm not going to rule it out at the moment. I think it might be a bit late for this year, but um, I've one of my neighbours that's also on my steering group uh, is trying some spring peas this year. So I shall be uh, I shall be picking his brains and seeing how he gets on, um, and uh, and go from there. <laughs> Definitely. And um, there's a couple of questions about. Um, your AB15 and overwinter stubble, Richard. Um, one question is how did you work out your AB15 um, cost there, Richard? I just wonder if you just talk through what you did um, to get to that total. So, um, so on, in terms of the AB15, so uh, it, it was, I literally went on to um, DEFRA uh, or RPA website uh, and, and to see how much per hectare they give uh, you that on uh, on your mid tier you know mid tier option, um, so which was the five hundred and twenty two pound hectare. Uh, then um, you've 
you obviously only get one of those per year. Uh, but then you get your seed cost. Now, your seed cost is quite high, uh, but you have to spread that because it's a two year option. Um, you have to spread that over two year period. So that was £73 a hectare. Um, now, if there are other costs in there that I haven't attributed, uh, so this is just AB15. So if there, if you can make use of overwinter stubble before you get to it, uh, drilling the AB15, then I've probably missed that. But that's some of my experience with having to, you know, pick off from RPA website the figures and not having the knowledge of actually growing it myself. So, um, you know, these are just things to try and that I've used to try and help build a picture for this for trying to see if it's actually going to work. Uh, and if there's something like that option that I've missed that, you know, great, then let's bring it in. Yes, it will change the figures, but um, I'd be interested to know by how much um, that's something I would look at. Cool. There's a couple of questions here, Marion, I'm going to ask you some good technical questions in a minute. Um, the couple of questions here, Richard, about do you miss having the livestock on the farm or, you know, with your soils, is there any opportunity to improve diversity by using a neighbour's livestock? Um, I don't know what your yeah, so, livestock. Uh, so we've got the beef finishers that are still on the farm, um, but they are housed. Um, now, one of the one of the issues we had, you're probably screaming at me, some guys saying, well, why are they indoors? Why aren't they roaming the fields eating catch crop or cover crops and, and things like that? Well, um, if I tell you a little story about um, a few years ago when we used to have dairy cows and we had some in-calf heifers. Uh, we've got a big main road that runs right next to the farm. Uh, and one one evening, um, somebody decided that it would be a really, really good idea to go and open the gates onto the main road. Uh, so there we were around midnight trying to find uh, 15 in-calf heifers. Uh, one of them had hit a car and uh, gone through somebody's windscreen. And as the farmer, we are liable. Um, and I don't want, you know, that to come back to me, um, you know, to hurt somebody else when we don't need to. So now we've, you know, we we don't, it, because at the same time, you know, anybody, we've had it before where somebody's cut, cut wire and let, you know, they want the animals to roam free and all this stuff. And, and, it's, and it's great if that's what you believe in, uh, but, on a practical level, it's really difficult when you see animals running through your crops because somebody's left the gate open or, you know, things like that. Um, so our fences are, are essential and a lot of our fences aren't good enough to hold the cattle. Uh, you know, they could hold dairy cows, but they wouldn't hold a beef animal. Um, so, you know, there's a huge cost involved in basically re-fencing a lot, large parts of the farm to be able to um, get those livestock outside um and so we do bring in muck to spread onto the fields to help with organic bringing organic matter back and i would actually say that we've got more organic matter now going back into our fields than when we had the dairy cows on the farm uh, because we had to take every ounce of straw off the fields um when we had the cows here you know we had maize and sugar beet in the rotation well neither of those um you know they took from fields they didn't they didn't put, put any organic matter back into the fields uh, unless we happen to spread muck on those fields previously. Um, but, you know, they just never seemed like there was enough muck to go around for, for the crops that we actually had uh, when the cows were here. Whereas now um, we rotationally chop straw with the combine as well as um, rotate the muck around the farm. Brilliant. And you are bringing in muck and looking at sewage sludge and, you know, all these kind of things to make up for that as well. Brilliant. Um, thank you, Richard. It is a difficult balance, isn't it, between, you know, as all these things that Marion's discussed, kind of keeping the soils going, have the diverse rotation, managing your pests um, and your diseases, Marion. So I've got a couple of questions here for you. Um, what type of crop is best as a take or break, um, would you suggest? Well, obviously, um, if you move from... Um, you know, from your cereal rotation to, to a break crop, you know, then you're going to break the cycle. Um, so we know that, you know, you get the, 
uh, increase in take all and then then you get take all decline if you had a continuous week eventually you know after about four or five years you start to get take all decline come in but and um we're growing continuous weeks less and less now so um and subsequent weeks so yeah i mean oats can provide a, a take all break and more oats going on there are two strains to take all and one is susceptible oats are susceptible to one of those strains but it's a lot less common than the wheat strain so generally speaking oats do give a break but um you know to be safer um, a broadleaf with broadleaf crop and we know that take all builds up more slowly in 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 barley scenarios and even more slowly in spring barley so you know those things to consider as well brilliant and um what about problems coming out of a two-year legume um with wireworm and leather jackets is that something to worry about um well if there's grass in there yeah i mean i have had a scenario where uh i've had people exploring grass lays because they wanted to use that as part of a black grass management strategy and um you know that has worked reasonably well in case in in terms of grass weed control but it's a bit like Boris Johnson at the moment. You you need a roadmap. I think that's the current jargon to get out of the grass lay um, because that's difficult moving from the grass lay back into a cereal rotation because we just don't have the armory to tackle those um, those uh, uh, soil pests really at the moment. So you know, a couple of things that you can think about um, is dare I say it, sort of relatively early drilled, well tillered wheat to sort of cope with the pest damage or, or think about a spring option that's less palatable to the pest, the pests. But um, yeah, it's not easy, that one. I have to say I've found that quite a challenge. And I think that's why thinking about some of these things in the round is, is the way to look at it as well, isn't it? You know, it's not the benefits of planning a rotation in the whole because then you can think through these things but that's easier said than done in some situations um we've got some good points here um picking up on some of the things that you both said about marketing being the key to alternatives and actually the real important bit when we're thinking about some of these break crops and some of these niche crops um i'm going to ask you i've got two more questions i think to ask you um there's a few questions in here um perhaps unsurprisingly about sugar beet and the few Future of sugar beet in the rotations. Richard, I'm going to ask you um, about with the kind of push to regenerative agriculture, conservation agriculture, you know, and what we've got with sugar beet at the moment. What's your thoughts on soils, sugar beet kind of having some of the root crops and maize um, in the rotation? Um, so thank you for that. Um, it's <laughs> uh, so from a personal perspective, um, I, I find, you know, sugar beet are all well and good if you can get them lifted early and get them into the factory uh, in really good conditions and get, get a good crop of wheat in. You know, you can get some good good margins on your wheat uh, in behind uh, and they do provide a good break. But my big caveat to that is obviously this compaction issue, there's far too many beet lifted in horrendous conditions. Uh, which is massacring fields. The, the kit is far too heavy now um, to be plodding around in some of these fields. Um, it's, it takes so many years, you know, you can try and subsoil all you like, you're not going to get deep enough to get rid of that compaction. Um, you know, I think it took us 10 years before we s didn't start to see, you know, we stopped seeing some of those effects that have been created by badly lifted sugar beet fields um, and and it just took you know the fields have to repair themselves there's sometimes there's just nothing you can do um, you know you just you can do all you like on the surface but you're not going to get down that low so and I think from you know from I think it's very difficult with the whole yes they've been given the near nick um, treatment to um, you know to be able to use on some of the seed this year but I I'm personally, I find that, you know, it's it's a very difficult subject because yes, it might allow it, allow the crop to be grown for another another year, but again, it comes back to yield. You need that yield, and if you can't get it because you've still got these pest issues, then should we actually be looking at other ways in which we can try and control these 
these pests um you know and it and it might be that we have to start growing flower strips um that are going to bring in more beneficial insects and different things we've really got to start paying attention to to that side of things because the insecticides i might be wrong but the insect insecticides um for me are, are already really struggling and not really effective and and we're we're doing more harm than good in some some cases so that's my take on it yeah there you go serious way to end but i think it comes right back round to marion where we started at the beginning doesn't it it's kind of the margin isn't the be all and end all anymore it's it's thinking about the soils and opportunities and um, we had a suggestion about whether we should add carbon onto our factors and some of these new things and soils and pests and the changing actives and the future is is where we're going and you know what will give us the best margin um in the future maybe it will be longer rotations um, and that will increase yield. So thank you, Richard and Marion. I think we're going to draw it to a close there. Thank you for answering those questions. And we will pick up, um, there's a few kind of specific questions in here and I think Richard and Marion, I'll, I'll give those and maybe we can reply to those people individually. So thank you for that. So we'll just move on. There's a couple of bits just to finish off tonight. Um, on the um, on the side of the panel here, you have got a couple of these as handouts, but just don't forget we've got all the HDB resources available online, um, some that are applicable to you um, in the wider sense, some of our pest encyclopedias, some specific kind of managing weeds in the rotation. You can still order hard copies from those or you can download it from our knowledge library. I have also included on the handouts tonight, and some people have been um, sending me some questions about it, some quite scary figures, Richard, we were looking at, but the uh, gross margins and net margins um, from the last few years of our farm bench figures, um, from the top 25% and the um, average. Um, some of you have been questioning um, some of those figures on there, but it definitely shows the, the need to think about the changes that are coming to BPS and the impact and the, the margins that we have on these crops. Um, so some other tools that we've got available have variety selection tools, the aphid news and um, tools to help you manage those crops in the rotation. And don't forget the market intelligence and um, things that are on the next slide, Marion, the kind of farm bench um, figures that you can do that Richard and Marion have referred to today. It's all free. It's there for you to use as the levy payers. Um, do make the most of that. If you can't find it on the website, um, either email me or, or Google what you want to find, um, and that's the best way of doing it. Equally, there are key contacts um, in, in AHDB on many of our technical topics. If you've got specific questions that you want to ask or want to dig out some of the research, um, please do give these people um, you get in contact with them or, or come back to me. Um, so it's just finally to say um, this is the first in a well a part of our Monitor Farm Monday series. Marion, if you could move on. Can you hear Teresa? I've got a note to say my webcam's closed by the organizer, so I don't know if you can contact I can hear me still. You. Keep okay. this. Thank you. Good. Uh, move on. Yes, please. Sorry. We're there. I've moved on. Oh, I've lost you. Okay. You've got a mind, Theresa, if you want. I'll quickly do that. Uh, yeah. correct Just one. To say thank you everybody for joining us um, tonight. Uh, this is the Monitor Farm Mondays um, sessions that are coming up. We're running through to early March before you get busy on farm. Um, next week's about fungicides and then we've got data management and lean management coming up um, every Monday from seven o'clock. So um, I think without further ado, um, Christian, it, well, it's just to say thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, it's been great to have you with us. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your engagement. Um, and a huge thank you to Marion and Richard um, for all of your input and um, thoughts, advice. I think, Marion, your final summing up slide and Richard, your thoughts on the margins. Um, thinking about it, thinking about the things in the round, um, thinking about all those different factors and how they come together for you and your farm business is really important. 
the session has been recorded tonight if you wanted to watch any of that back um, and please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any further questions there will be a survey as you leave tonight and um, if you've got any thoughts comments um, we do really use that and find that really valuable if there's anything you think we can improve or things that you like to let us know um, and it's really helpful for us as we go forward so hope you have a good rest of your evening. Um, stay warm, stay safe. Anything else, drop me an email, theresa.meadows.hdb.org.uk. A big thank you to Marion and Richard, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.